Okay. Today we're going to talk about the delivery, the presentation, or pronunciatio, as it's called in Latin, um, which is the fifth, the last of the five steps of rhetoric. Um, we'll, next week, then, we will finish out with applying the principles and then the final exam. Again, I encourage everyone to study the notes and to take the exam. You will learn more that way. Even if you're not doing this for credit, take the test. Because what are you if you don't try? Um, so I encourage you to do that. We have all along been dealing with this as um, the, using the model of traditional um, rhetoric. Rhetoric being the use of language, and I define, this is my own definition, language is the combination of logic and grammar. In other words, to think clearly and then to use language grammar to communicate uh, your thoughts. To instruct and persuade a listener or reader. The five canons, as we've gone through them, invention, which is deciding what you want or need to say and why you need to say it. Secondly, arrangement, making the decision. How do I structure and organize my message to best communicate with this particular audience? And that will vary depending on if it's a formal setting or informal, etc. Third, style. What best approach can I, uh, what best, what by what approach can I best communicate this message to this audience? Then last week we talked about memory, which says how can I be best prepared to effectively deliver this message to the audience from the use of certain kinds of notes, outline, memorizing the text, etc. Today, today we are going to be talking about delivery. He has a perfect. Door. The doors are closed. Yeah, they must be right outside. So delivery or pronunciatio in Latin is the gestures, pronunciation, tone, and pace used when presenting. Uh, the question I ask to get at that is in what, in practical terms, how can I best present this message? So everything else has been getting you ready. This is when, speaking of sermons, you actually step in the pulpit. How do I best do the actual presentation? All right. Now, the discipline, is he parked right outside the door? He's close, yes. Could he maybe move down one direction or the other? I don't know. Um, the discipline of presenting discourse well. You know, a sermon, a teaching, whatever it is. How do we present it well? Now, today, there is a tendency for presentation to either overemphasize the style, in other words, for the presentation to be overemphasized, that means style over content, or else they go the opposite direction and they underemphasize the presentation, so the delivery of accurate content without regard to style is the typical. Now, what I mean by that, the underemphasizing the presentation is like um, the or overemphasize, excuse me, like the mass media, the soundbite idea. You know, what you say isn't as important as how you say it. You know, get, getting it across, looking good. Um, this is why they say that there will never be another bald president, because how you look is almost more important than what you have to say. Um, it's why during the debates, the famous debates between John Kennedy and Richard Nixon, people who heard the debate on the radio the majority of them felt like Nixon won. The people who watched it on TV, the vast majority of them said that Kennedy won. The difference is, how did it look? What was the presentation like? And you know, apparently, I don't remember this. Nixon, you know, you could see the sweat on his forehead and everything else, and he seemed less confident visually. So, the tendency in mass media, uh, especially modern media, is to emphasize the style of presentation over the content. But on the other hand, when we're talking about giving sermons, too many people who, who are involved in preaching or teaching in the church, they're so concerned about having accurate content that they're reading this stuff, okay? They're not, they don't have an appropriate regard for the way they present. They're only concerned about making sure that they get all of the content out there for people to hear. And so they don't pay attention to the aspects of presentation. We tend to go to one extreme or the other. Mass media, style over content, sermon preaching, where we're so focused on getting the content right that the presentation is awful and people have trouble watching. Right? We don't understand the balance. And in fact, the goal we have is to find a balance in which good content 
is accurately delivered, so that's getting the accurate content out there, but good presentation is acknowledged as being criti as critical for the message being well received, remembered, and persuasive. We can get the best content in the world, and if the way we do it, nobody can stand to look at us or listen to us, we're not going to benefit anybody. So we have to try to find that balance when we do presentation. Much of good presentation involves good elocution. It's a word. They used to have elocution classes, you know, especially for teaching young people to speak correctly. Elocution is the study of the pronunciation, grammar, style, and tone in speaking. The other part of this is what the Latin word is actio, which is the use of the voice and gestures in oratorio. So one, elocution has to do with your voice. Actio has to do with, with range and pitch of voice, but more so gestures. How do you look? How do you present yourself? And attention to those two aspects of it, overall, to present, uh, to focus on pronunciario, how the presentation is done, is really important if you expect to make a difference. Great content, poorly presented, is not going to get you what you want or what you feel called to do. You've got to have both. Okay? Questions about that? I'm going to spend most of our time today, and we may not go the full two hours, uh, talking about very practical. This is the very practical part of it. So practical approaches to pronunciario, the presentation. First, people have to find you acceptable. We talked before about the ethos. You have to come across as seeming intelligent. And like, you know, you have to, if you're standing in a pulpit, you have to seem like somebody they would want to listen to or even get to know. Right? There are several different aspects to this. One, you need to present yourself with dignity. Now, this does not mean somberness or over seriousness, but you need to dress in a way that's appropriate to the setting. Those of you who, who come to our church or have been to our church, you'll notice I don't wear a tie. That's because of where we are. People do not wear ties to church down here. If I were, if I were asked to preach at a, a church in Dallas, and I dress the way I usually dress here on Sunday morning, they probably wouldn't let me get in the pulpit. Because in Dallas, everybody who goes to church dresses to the nines. I mean, they, they're, that's a huge deal for them. It's a very different culture. It's a very different climate. So you need to dress in a way that is appropriate to the setting and is considered dignified. When I started here, I decided I needed to go. I didn't think wearing a tie and a jacket was appropriate to the setting. It's not to say that it... Um, it wouldn't be a huge problem, but I didn't think it really fit. And I decided either I'm going to dress in presentable, but sort of, sort of business casual kind of clothes, or I was going to wear the, the robes. And I just said, you know, I don't want to go the whole robe route, because that, that for a church that's not a high church, Episcopal, uh, Anglican, Catholic, that creates kind of a barrier in terms of relationship. And so I decided that's, that's not appropriate for our setting either. But, so I dress kind of business casual. I don't wear jeans in the pulpit, etc. I don't wear this in the pulpit. <laughs> but I do, um, you know, I, I don't dress up. Um, have open collars. I, I have one shirt that's, that I think I wore last week. It's like black and it's got these white panels in the front. A friend of mine called that a Mexican tuxedo. So, uh, <laughs> so well, but dress appropriate to the setting. How you stand, your posture, your gestures, all of those reflect a certain kind of dignity. And again, that doesn't mean you have to be overly serious about this. I'm going to get to that in a second. But one of the things that people, that some people do is it, it, they'll get up there to preach, and it'll be this. Now, there are times when if you want to make a point, leaning over or leaning on the pulpit or whatever, might be used as a gesture. But to do that, to stand up here like this and preach, simply doesn't cut it. And I think you can see why. And yet, some people will do that. Um, so how you stand, what your posture is. If I'm standing up here like this, you know, I've got this thing on, but you, know, that gets, you look lazy. You're not presenting dignity when you do that. And you can, be, you can have dignity and still have the next point, which is warmth. People need to feel like they can relate to you. And one of the ways you do that is by appropriate humor. Appropriate being the, you know, the, 
important word here. There is very much inappropriate humor. That, and that appropriate means not inappropriate, but it also means that it fits in. You don't say, I found a really good joke, I need to figure out a way to, to use that on Sunday. Uh, humor that just sort of happens um, is exactly what you're looking for because it can, and it's not contrary to dignity. It conveys a warmth, it conveys a welcomeness. In our church, it, we usually take the first 10 minutes doing announcements, etc. And I consider it an important part of getting people into the service that I'm, you know, I'm a little bit of a clown intentionally during that time. I make jokes, I tease people a little bit, you know, uh, we always say, who's going back up north can take mail, and if two people raise their hands, quite frequently I'll say, well, you just, there's two options, pick one, whichever one you think looks more reliable, you know, or something of that sort. That's not undignified, but I think it makes people, they laugh a little bit, people feel more comfortable. You know, it's not the, you know, uh, kind of stuff. Then, in order to make sure that we don't continue in that lighthearted mood, the first thing we have is the prayer of invocation. Very early on in the prayer of invocation, the prayer of invocation will call for us for a moment of silence as we turn our hearts to God. And so everybody focuses, and they're quiet. And then we're into the rest of the worship. And that's, that transition is very intentional, both... Loosen people up, warm them up, make them feel comfortable, but then make sure that we're focusing ourselves, you know, not looking for the next joke before we get into the rest of the worship. Yes? I think for this congregation, what you do is really important because we are a noisy group before church. Mm -hmm. You know, we're so social and we're out on the street in the parking lot talking and we're talking here, and sometimes you have quite a chore getting us to yeah. come together and take our seats. And so we need that time of announcements and stuff to right. sort of step by in. step. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, I'll get up and I'll say, good morning, welcome. And if sometimes if the, all of the talking is, is still going, I'll go, hello, yeah. you know, my turn now, or something. Yeah. Which is, again, people laugh, but it accomplishes what we want to accomplish. And they know I'm going to be serious about this too. But at that time... The idea, and it's, I, I try not to be undignified about it, you know, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not just going are for the laugh. Angry about it. What's that? Neither are you like the angry parent. Right. You're, you're just <laughs> like a parent who's saying, come on guys, it's time. Right, and some of that, I learned a, a miraculous lesson once from a professor of mine, Richard Sears, who's also a friend. Um, and Richard and I were, he was my mentor for my independent major, and, and I learned from him, Richard could say the most, um, sort of biting things and then and then laugh really loud <laughs> and people didn't know whether it was funny or whether they should feel hurt you know and i'm not saying be a cervix be biting but the point is that you if you need to do something like call people to order you know or okay quiet down now and you do it and laugh or you do it as a, as a, in a joking way people are usually fine with that and that keeps them from feeling like you're shaking your finger at them etc um and so that's part of it, is, is make it a joke and laugh when you do it, and people are going to be okay. But you do need to do that. But appropriate humor usually is humor that just comes out of the moment. It's not like, I got a joke to tell you, you know. Um, if I wore your glasses, you think I could see your wife home? You know, um, whatever. That's, that's not what you're looking for when I say humor. So, but something that is appropriate, that's, that shows a comfort level. That's what it amounts to. So you need, there, you need to feel comfortable and you need to convey comfort because if the person up front is is clearly uncomfortable then nobody's going to be comfortable you know if the mommy's not happy then nobody's going to be happy well the same thing is true with whoever's preaching if the person up front leading worship etc is not comfortable and clearly not comfortable then everybody's subconsciously they, they may not consciously think this they're going to feel like there's a reason why i shouldn't be comfortable something's wrong here and i don't know what it is yet so that's critically important. So people have to find you acceptable. The ethos is the is the one of the aspect of that in the traditional. You see, you need to be seen warm, dignified, relatable, um, intelligent, somebody they'd want to meet, get to know, listen to. The second thing is people must be able to hear you. Duh. There's several parts to this. One is projection. Most people, um, I've been doing this so long in terms of public speaking and stuff, I don't even think about it. But most people, when they first start out, 
the tendency is for people to talk from here. Do you hear the difference in my voice? And even then, my voice is probably louder than a lot of people's because they talk, you know, they, th their voice is coming from here. When I talk, it comes from down here if I'm projecting. Now, it doesn't mean that your voice, when you're, when you're, and, and to do it, if you're not used to doing that, tighten your diaphragm. Speak from down here. Now, some people make the mistake of thinking that projecting means changing the pitch. Instead of talking from here, they'll try to talk from here. And that's to, that isn't it. Pitch is not the thing that makes projection. They talk about support. If you've ever been involved in singing, you know, they'll say, tighten your diaphragm, support from, from down here. And that really is the case. Once you get used to doing that, you don't even think about it. When I need to, when I need to speak to the back of the room, and I'm going to talk about technical problems in a second, if the microphone's out or whatever, I can do fine without it. I just speak more to the back of the room. Carolyn? Part of it is nervousness, because when, you, when you're nervous, you don't breathe deeply enough. Exactly. And if you're not nervous, you will deep, you'll breathe from your diaphragm. Exactly. It's a it, exa very good point. The same thing, like appropriate humor, you need to feel comfortable. I'm going to talk later on about self-confidence. When you first start doing this, you may not feel confident about it, but you need to have, you need to be rehearsed enough, you need to have enough experience of this that eventually it becomes very natural. It becomes very comfortable. I know that in the Western world, the greatest single fear people have, greater than the fear of death or taxes or snakes or spiders or anything else, is the fear of speaking in public. All the studies have shown that. And so if you're not used to it, it's, it's very scary. And so people don't tend not to support it, they tend to talk from up here, and that's not, that doesn't project. I mean, I'm, I'm overdoing this, but I'm, I'm letting my voice get a little squeaky. But the fact is, if you're, if you're, as Carolyn said, if you're not comfortable, you don't breathe deep, you breathe shallowly, you breathe shallowly, you can't project. It's not possible. That's not the way the physics. So you need to learn to speak from here, to project your voice, to reach the back row when you need to. And that's not just, a, it's a matter of volume of being able to speak louder. And sometimes you just have to decide, I'm going to turn the volume up. But it's more than that. There's actually a quality of resonance that has to do with projection that you have to practice and you have to learn how to do that. A good, thing, a good way to do it is tighten your diaphragm and think about speaking to the person in the last seat of the last row and you will begin to project. Does that make sense? Questions about that? Chris? When you're, mic when you're using a microphone, do you project still the same as the guy you're talking to? The guy not to the same. You it down? Yeah, not to the same level. No, in the microphone. But you still have to. The danger of becoming sort of a Minnie Mouse kind of voice. Right. You still have to support. You still have to project. You just don't have to do it as much force. I've got technical setup and dealing with problems. If you have a mic, you need to. I'm going to talk about getting early, getting there earlier in a little bit. You need to get there. You need to check, test the mic, see how sensitive it is. Make sure that you're, see one of the things that I, I don't usually use a lavalier mic, but when I do use a lavalier mic, I have to be careful because when I glance down, you know, I want to look at my notes, then, then my voice goes, Rawr, you know. Um, my preaching professor, Ian Pitt Watson, said that he really didn't like lavalier mics. He much preferred to have a stationary mic on the podium or next to it um, because then he can control what happens. He can lean into it and let the microphone increase the volume, or you can step away from it. You know, it's just, you've seen singers who, you know, who, who will do this, right? Because they can, they can use the microphone to adjust some of the volume. Now, you still need to project because of that resonance I was talking about. But whether or not you need to turn the volume up is dependent upon the microphone, okay? And it even depends on what kind of microphone you have, which is why you really, if you haven't preached somewhere before, if you don't know how it works, then you need to know in advance. You need to get there early enough that you're able to try it out. Um, don't ever, ever, ever do what happened to us at the Christmas Eve service, where we were supposed to have had the sound system set up the day before, and they didn't, didn't come. Then they were going to get there. Promise us they would get there early. Well, they got there early and delivered the stuff, but the guy was actually going to set it up, then showed up 40 minutes before the service started. And then he disappeared, and he came back four minutes before the service started. Four minutes. And I said, forget it. We're not going to be doing sound checks and stuff right now. He said, well, let me set up one speaker for you. He set the speaker up, set a microphone up, and it was horrible. Yeah. The, the, the 
the timbre of the microphone and, and speaker was bad, everything, you know. Don't do that! I should never have let the guy set up that speaker the last time. But the reason I did is because we had a few people, we had a lot of people reading that day. And a few of the people reading, I know, don't tend to have big voices. They don't project well. And so that I was concerned about that. So I, you know, went against my own, I, my own good judgment there and said, okay, go ahead and set up the speaker at the last possible moment. Dealing with problems. There will be a time, if you do this very much, where you're right in the middle of you talking, the battery goes out on the microphone, you know, the portable mic, or you get feedback for some reason, or whatever. The only way to deal with that is, I mean, if it's a matter of just turning the volume down or whatever, then do it. But if it's something that's going to take more of a fix than that, do not stop to deal with that. Just like if, if, if I'm using a microphone and, and I'm having problems with it or whatever, I will say, you know, this thing just, we're not going to mess with this. And I'll just take it off and set it aside, and that's when I need to start projecting to the back row. So dealing with problems, just cut to the chase, get over it as quickly as you can, and move on. Don't dwell on it, don't yell about it, don't moan about it, don't take 10 minutes to figure out how you can get the microphone back on. Now, it will be a very different situation if you are, you know, in an auditorium of 25,000 people. And there's no way the people in, you know, back in the nosebleeds are going to hear you. Then you have to say, you know, I'm very sorry, it's going to take a minute to fix this. And then step away and let the technical people fix it. But in a typical church setting, don't even try if you're in the middle of a sermon. Set it aside, start, you know, pick up your voice projection, and move on from there. All right? Um, but people have to be able to hear you or they're not going to get anything out of it. Doesn't mean everybody can hear you, but some of that's on them. <laughs> uh, you can't really do anything about that. Third, people have to be able to understand you. First, they have to be able to hear you. So we talked about they have to find you acceptable. You know, you're not turning, completely turning them off. Then they have to be able to hear you. Then they have to be able to understand you. They, they can hear the, the stuff coming out of your mouth and not be able to understand. Some preachers, I swear, come across like Charlie Brown's teacher. You know Charlie Brown's teacher? Wah, 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 wah. Whenever, like Charlie Brown Christmas, whatever, whenever his teacher is saying something, wah, wah. You can hear it just fine. You have no clue what the meaning behind it is. And you have to be able to be understood as well as heard. The way to do that first is by enunciating. Enunciating means you say the words clearly. Um, there was an ad that used to run back when I lived in Kentucky. There was a brand of bread called Old Hearth Bread. Well, they had a commercial on TV, and they had this whole, like, family, a man, a woman, and two kids, and they're dancing around, and, they're, and I, listen, I heard this several times before I figured out what it was. They're dancing around singing, and for all the world, it sounded like they were saying, old hard bread, you know, because they were not enunciating hearth. Old hard bread, and I'm thinking, why in the world would you want to buy old hard bread? <laughs> you get the same problems. People will start slurring the words and say, I mean, you're not in Nancy, it's back. <laughs> what good does that do? You have to enunciate. It also means you have to make a point of not using faults. In you, and that means, um, uh. Actually, when I'm lecturing, because sometimes as I'm, if I'm going slow, you know, I will sometimes still, I catch myself doing it on the tapes. I'll do an um every once in a while. I used to have a huge problem with uh. Uh, and as we, uh, or some people today, it's right. Well, we like right, you know, uh, and you know, you know, uh, we well, you know, we we've got the thing, you know, and, and you know, with the with the right and the uh, those are faults in language. <clears throat> and if you have that, they're they're the equivalent of a facial tick. They're a verbal tick. If you have a verbal <laughs> tick of any kind. Now, there are some verbal tics, like stuttering, or et cetera, which are a much bigger deal. I mean, they don't, the, to deal with those, you probably need professional assistance. Uh, somebody who has the ability to help you deal with all of that. But if your problem is, you know, or like, or um, or ah, uh, you need to teach yourself not to do that. And you can. 
Carolyn has been in part of Toastmasters. And she'll tell you, people who are, in, one of the things they teach you in Toastmasters, if you have a verbal tick, is they'll sometimes have a little bell. And as you're doing a presentation, every time you say, mm, or, uh, or, you know, they'll click, they'll ring the bell. Ding, ding, ding. It doesn't take long before you start being aware of it. Because the problem with the vocal tick is that you, you don't hear it anymore. So you need to be aware. It may mean if you don't have somebody else who can help you with a little bell, you know, or smack you back the head every time you do it, or whatever it is, <laughs> then you need to record yourself and listen to yourself on recording and become, first step is become more aware. That's what the bell thing. And then begin to be aware as you're doing it and stop it. When I was a kid, I wore glasses and my glasses would ride down my nose and I would, I would do that. Well, my mother started, every time I did that, she'd go like this and I stopped. I had to become aware of it and I needed somebody's help with that. If you have a verbal tick, a fault, then you need to become aware of it, deal with it. And you can learn not to. Like I say, I had a terrible uh problem a long time ago, but still. If you have any questions, let me know. Next, correct pronunciation. If you're not sure how to pronounce a word, look it up. The thing about the, the internet is you can look up a word and it will pronounce it for you. There's a little microphone, a little uh, speaker there, you click on it, it'll pronounce the word for you. That's the, the usual words. If you ever say nuclear, I will smack you upside the head. That's one of my, Carolyn and I, one of our pet ticks. The word is nuclear, not nuclear. Don't ever say nuclear. There are other words which commonly get mispronounced. So one thing is, learn how to pronounce words correctly. And if you don't know, look them up. That's important. You are going to be a professional orator, whether they pay you for it or not, if you're going to be a preacher or a teacher. And you need to learn to speak correctly in terms of pronunciation. Now, no bad words. <laughs> that means, um, and that comes from our friend Jane Pfeiffer, Jane and Norm Pfeiffer, who are, uh, have been leaders in our church, they were one of the founders. When I would ask them to read, say, a scripture or a responsive reading or whatever, Cara, um, Jane would say, are there any bad words in it? Well, the first time she ever said that, Norm, who's also on the line because I was on the telephone, said, Jane, it's scripture. There's no bad words. She meant words that are hard to pronounce, that those are bad words in the, in the scripture readings. You know. um, if you come across a word, now again, anything you're going to be reading or anything you're going to be saying, you're going to rehearse it in advance. You're going to go over it in advance. You don't stand up and read things cold, even if it's reading. People say, oh, I know how to read. Well, that's, you know how to read badly if you don't know enough to, be, to read the stuff in advance. If you are reading, let's say, a scripture, and there are biblical names or things of that sort that you don't know, well, you can look them up. If you can't find them, because they don't always have, in the little pronunciation guides. <clears throat> the thing to do is look at the word and say, it appears as though this is how to pronounce it. And when you get to it, pronounce it like you think it needs to be pronounced because you've thought about it. You're not just doing it off the cuff. You're not winging it. Pronounce it the way you think it needs to be, ought to be pronounced in the absence of some other source. Say it with confidence. And as one of my teachers in... in seminary said, and everybody in the congregation will think, I always wondered how to pronounce that. Now I know. <laughs> so if you're not sure, look at it, think about how you think it ought to be pronounced, pronounce it that way and pronounce it with confidence. You may start a trend. Is it Habakkuk or Habakkuk? People differ. Okay. Thessalonica or Thessaloniki? But when you say it, don't waffle. Say it like you know what you're talking about. That's important because confidence, we're going to talk about confidence. If you seem like you're not really sure how you even pronounce the words, how far are you going to get in convincing people that they need to spiritually reevaluate their lives? Okay. So, for you, when you do it, there are no bad words. You pronounce them with confidence. And if you have a question, I always when I send out the readings to our people every week. 
I always say if you have a question, please let me know. And from time to time, somebody will call me and say, how do you pronounce this word in the second paragraph? And I will tell them. So the, there are other resources you can come to, but the main thing is do it with confidence. <clears throat> Third, pace and pitch. <clears throat> I tend to talk too fast. What? What? <laughs> Especially for elderly people, of which we have a few. And I recognize that. But um, there's a limit to how much I can do. We had uh, a dear woman on our church, Annette Pell, uh, who passed away a few, a few years ago. Annette would sit in the back row, she, and she was Dutch. English was not her first language. And she would sit in the back row and go, like this to me, while I was preaching, <laughs> to tell me to slow down, and I would try to slow down some. Studies have been done, however, that indicate, and I'm not using this as an excuse, these studies really have been done, that someone who speaks more quickly rather than less quickly is perceived as being more intelligent and more credible. They talk about a fast-talking salesman. Why do you think salesmen talk fast? Because people are more likely to buy their stuff rather than if they talk like this. Okay, I'm from the South, but I tell people I'm from Tennessee, and or, or they hear my, you know, when my parents were alive, when they would hear my parents, especially my mother speak, my. My assistant came in my office one day when I worked for World Vision in California, and she said, Ross, there's a woman on the phone, she says she's your mother, but I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> because accents, rate of speech, etc. So, if you have to go one way or the other, as if you can control it, it's better to talk a little faster than too slow. Just like in music, in the church. Better the music is a little too fast than too slow, because then it's just... Okay? So... I probably should slow down some, but I've been, <laughs> Joan is sitting over there going, yeah, <laughs> but it's sort of who I am, and in, the, in one way, it reflects enthusiasm for stuff, too, so, yeah, I should do better, but you can, Joan. When I was giving your lectures in Uganda, fortunately, the, the media player that I was using allowed me to slow it down, ah! because <laughs> At your regular pace, because for them, your accent is unfamiliar and English is a second language for them, then they couldn't follow. Uh, sure, I'm, I'm sure. And that's true. I know for people who don't speak English and are not used to hearing somebody talk as fast as I do, um, that, that's a real problem. So I'm glad you had that recorded that will let you slow it down. Um, so that's an issue, is pace. If you talk too fast, you're going to leave some people behind. If you go too slow, your credibility is going to suffer. And people are going to get bored. Oh, I wish you would hurry. Up. You have done? You ever? Oh, come on, come on, come on! You can get it out. This. You know, there is a medium in there, and it's a fairly wide medium. But you need to find it for yourself, based upon your own style. See, if I if I tried too hard to speak slowly, it would not be me. And I think that that would falsify a lot of what I'm trying to do. So you got to find the the right. And in terms of pitch, pitch is high. Low. Some people, as I said, make the mistake of thinking that in order to project, they need to speak like this. I've had people get up in the pulpit and to read or whatever, and they start out like this. And I'm thinking, what, are you, what cartoon character are you being right now? Okay. Now, if your voice is really in that timber, if that's really where you know, your voice is like, the, like Lloyd Ogilvy or somebody, you know, the voice of God or James Earl Jones, fine. But if your voice is like mine, then don't get up there and start trying to talk like this, thinking that your deeper voice is going to convey more. It doesn't. People just go, why is he talking like that? All right? Likewise, some people think that in order to project, they need to get up there and project that way. You know, then they're going to hear it. And they're not. And you sound like Minnie Mouse or whatever, you know. Um, speak in your own voice. Now, again, when, you, when you're trying to project, you naturally will get more resonance in your voice and it will sound a little deeper, but not because you're trying to speak deeper, thinking that's where, what, where you should go. So use your voice. People do not want to hear an artificial voice because they're not going to be hearing what you're reading or what you're saying. They're going to go, what? who is he being right now? You know, I had knuckle it sounded like that once and they discovered it was a tumor. I, whatever. <laughs> Don't do that. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, stupid joke. You also get phrasing and emphasis uh, are part of this. Phrasing can be very important. Phrasing means, you, you know, you, 
emphasize the phrase, where do you have pauses, where do you have breaks? And from, there have been a, a, several people um, who are widely known for their phrasing. Can you think of a musician whose phrasing is famous? Lay, lady, lay, lay upon your big grass bed. I'm exaggerating, but Bob Dylan. He has a very unique phrasing. You hear Bob Dylan start singing and you know it's Bob Dylan and not, not the thing you mostly know, whether you recognize it or not, is the phrasing. Where does he emphasize? Where does he push the words? Some people think that sounds really hokey. Some people feel like it's very poetic. Another one, uh, Leonard, Cohen. Leonard, Leonard, Leonard Cohen. Leonard Cohen, okay, good one. I like him, you know. Um, uh, uh, Spock. You know, oh, Captain Kirk. You know, a great Canadian. A great Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's, you know, well, Spock, Spock I don't know, Spock. Spock. <laughs> what are we doing? You know, you, you get so phrasing can be very characteristic. I'm not saying you exaggerate that much, but you need to be aware of the fact that how phrasing comes out can emphasize things you want to emphasize. It can. You know, give people a chance to pause, think about things. So phrasing is important. Don't overthink that. Part of it, I guess, is that if you find, if you by nature have a weird sort of Bob Dylan kind of phrasing, you need to think about, do I need to work away from that? Because maybe that's too much. Uh, as I say, some people, like my wife, really don't like Bob Dylan primarily because of the phrasing. Um, she thinks it sounds silly, right? Well, it's not singing. Yeah. <laughs> it's just not. Bob Dylan has not. A, that unique voice to go with it. And, so. and related to phrasing is emphasis. You know, where are you going to emphasize? And as I say, my, my preaching professor, E.F. Watson, liked that having a stationary microphone because the very simple thing he could do for emphasis is lean into it. You got a word or a phrase you want to emphasize? All you get is lean into the mic. Uh, it's, that's hard to do if you're wearing a lavalier or something of that sort. Uh, but there are other ways you can emphasize words, phrases, etc. But that's a vocal thing. Fourth, people must believe you. You're not getting anywhere if they listen. If they see you up there and they go, "Okay, he's preaching. I've got, I'm not rejecting him outright." They can hear you. They can understand you, but you don't convince them. Now, part of the convincing, I've got logos and pathos on there. Logos is the use of logical argument. You remember ethos, logos, and pathos? I said they're the three musketeers of the rhetoric process. Uh, ethos is presenting yourself in an acceptable way. Logos is using logic in a way that is compelling and convincing. Pathos is to use appropriate emotion, you know, it's stories which tug at the heart, you know, make people, get people into the story. Well, all of those are part of it. Those are the content questions. But in addition to that, for people to believe you, they need to perceive authenticity, that you're being real with them. That, that you're not a snake oil salesman who happens to be standing in the pulpit right now. There are several ways you do that. One is by meaning what you say. And if you don't really mean what you're saying, then God, God help you if you're in a pulpit preaching his word and you don't really believe it. So that's the first thing. Authenticity means you believe this is true. But also things like eye contact, looking at people, looking in their eyes. If, you, if you're up here and preaching and you never look in anybody's face, look in their eyes, then people are not going to believe you're authentic. They're not going to accept you. So that's critically important. This is one of the reasons of why you can't just read your sermon. And some, you know, people who, um, preachers who tend to do more of that, they are sacrificing that eyeball thing. We talked about that last week with the memory question, the impact of being able to look at people. Um, facial expressions in terms of authenticity. If you if you're talking about surprise, you know, couldn't believe it. Your facial expression, your gestures, all of those things add to authenticity. If you go, I was just shocked. And there's nothing there, you know, I was just shocked versus I was shocked. You know, that adds, it, it sounds like you believe it, like you really were. Not that you're just make, making something up. So, Facial expressions, eye contact are critical to that. Also, transparency. You've got to be transparent with people, meaning you have, it's not you up there on a high horse pedestal preaching to all the poor pagan non-believers or fall back, you know. You're not better than them. 
Christianity is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And we are beggars. And that, we talked before about the fact that when you're discussing especially negative things, that use we and us, not you. You need to stop that. That's not what they need to hear. Because, well, what about you? Are you perfect? There has to be a sense of transparency in which you're willing to admit your own foibles. Or say, to be prepared to say things like, this is, I struggle with this too. Um, and some of that has to, it's a matter of the presentation. Okay, let's start back. One other thing having to do with this uh, practical approach is that Bob reminded me of, he was saying that, you know, Pentecostals, Pentecostal preachers. Oh, we're just going to generalize now. Well, yeah, it is, it is, it's not universal of Pentecostal preachers, uh, certainly not many of them do, but some of them do, where they will, their phrasing will be broken up with, you know, noises. They'll say things like, and God said, huh, all the people needed to, huh, get, you know, that's a very old traditional kind of uh, sort of revival thing, and it is true. Now, I consider that a fault. That's a verbal fault. People do it as a... You know, it's it's much worse than Canadians saying "a" hey, after things. So uh, I'm uh, wrong with that word. Hey. Uh, uh, <laughs> makes everything a question. But and, and that's that's one you know one thing. The other, which I've experienced as well, are people who preachers who scream. I just I just told the story. We were talking about this right then when I was a counselor, in, junior counselor at a Bible camp. Um, some of us went to a revival meeting one night that they were having locally. And there were several of us, but two women who were older women, single but lifetime missionaries. Um, we went, and this guy screamed. I mean, he screamed the whole time. Um, Hi, can we help you? No, I'm looking for Sammy. Uh, he's not been around since uh, about 10 o'clock this morning. Okay, thank you. Um, he, uh, and he just screamed. I mean, it was painful. Mm. And afterwards, the, we went up to these two ladies who were lifetime missionaries went up and said, you know, we came here to hear the Word of God, but if he was here, we couldn't have heard him because you were screaming so loud. And, I mean, they were just right there and said, you know, that, that was really uncomfortable, and you need to not do that. And he said, you know, I understand what you're saying. My wife will not come to services because of that. She can't stand it. And uh, he said, it's just that's who I am. That's who God made me. You know, that's how he calls me to preach. Well, no, that's not true. You have developed a really bad habit, and you're not willing to do what it takes to break it. Because that's so. That's the opposite of people must be able to hear you. People must not have to hear you too much. <laughs> Screaming at people, shouting at them. I mean, that doesn't mean that there's there might not be one place in the sermon that you want to make a really strong point and you get really loud. But if you're doing that through the whole sermon, then you, you're doing it wrong. I don't think there's ever a justification for that. Right? Um, all right, let's move on. Further practical approaches to, to pronunciado, the presentation. Now this has to do with getting ready for your presentation, and that is rehearse your delivery. What, the things I'm about to tell you are especially true if you're not used to doing this. Everyone, once they get into it, we talked about this last week in terms of style of notes or outline or memorizing or whatever, everyone has to find a style that they're comfortable with. But Especially until you get used to this, until this becomes a common practice for you, these are all good ideas, and they may be good ideas for you anyway. Particularly if you've got a sermon that you're, you're preparing to preach and you're not feeling really comfortable about it, you, it's not sinking in, you're not sure it works. Rehearse your delivery. That is, don't wait until you get up there to do it the first time. Rehearse it. Stand, and when I say rehearse it, that means, in this case, say it out loud, okay? Practice it out loud. Listen to yourself. The rehearse thing, the rehearse your delivery, this is a kind of overarching. Maybe I should have made these subpoints. Practice it out loud and listen to your own voice as you go along. Now, what you hear, because of the nature of, you know, auditory canals and everything else, you don't hear your voice the way everyone else hears it. But you can still tell if there's a serious problem. You can tell if you're going too fast. You can tell if you're not enunciating. Those things should be clear to you. And so listen to your own voice as you practice out loud. Then record your message and listen to it. That way you really will hear what other people are hearing. 
and not just the way it sounds coming through your skull. So record it, play it back. If you don't have a recorder, there are little recorder apps that you can get on the computer that will record things for you. And almost every computer has microphone built into it now. There are a lot of ways to deal with this. Yes? Uh, prior to home technology, to do that type of stuff, um, what I used to do is practice in front of the mirror. Right. And, you know, so that, and I still do it. Yeah, and you get, you get the visuals that way, and that's very helpful. The idea of uh, practicing out loud, especially practicing out loud in front of a mirror, then you get it. Now, there's nothing, well, there's very few things more horrifying than the videos that are available today. I mean, they weren't videos originally, they were films of Adolf Hitler practicing. You ever seen those? Mm -hmm. You know, he would practice this kind of thing and, you know, and, and, and stuff that looks so artificial now. And yet, he seemed to have this extraordinary ability to hold huge crowds of people spellbound, which is one, one of the characteristics of satanic influence, by the way. Um, and I, that's really scary to me. I mean, with the, I, the, I think it's very valuable to stand in front of a mirror and practice those. But when you find yourself starting to do this kind of thing, and you know, stop. Gestures need to be something that just naturally happen. Okay, they, they, if you have to think about, okay, now's the time I'm going to do this, then it's probably a bad idea. You know, or your Heisman you, you kind of stance. They can't be artificial. It has to be something that's very natural for you. But you do need to move your arms, too. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. So record your message and listen to it. Practice at normal speed and pause for reactions. You know, if, um, you know, if your notes say, loud round of applause, or, you know, much laughter, or whatever, <laughs> then give a pause for that so that you get a sense of the, of the whole rhythm of the thing. Um, practice at double speed. Say it twice as fast as you usually would. And the reason for that is because if you go through doing it twice as fast, you will find that you have a different perception of the order of things. You will begin to notice if there's a disconnect, if there's not good transition. Um, it will help anchor it in your mind. If you're able to do it twice as fast, then you're twice as ready to do it at normal speed. And so the other thing is do it at half speed. Talk slower. Have longer pauses. Again, this will help anchor it in your mind. It will make it clear to you what the flow is. You may figure out by doing it faster and doing it slower. The way I was doing it the first time wasn't, you know, I need to speed it up a little bit. I need to slow it down a little bit. You won't notice that until you maybe practice it at that. But both going faster and going slower than, than you feel is normal will help sort of absorb the message and the flow and the connecting material and everything to you. You will know better what you're going to say. You remember last week we said the real key is before you get in the pulpit, know what you're going to say. Don't get up there and then surprise yourself by, oh, I forgot I was going to talk about that. You know, but people do that, and you can see it. Practice mentally. Go through the talk in your own mind, thinking about what you will say and how you will say it. I especially do this on Saturday night as I'm getting ready for bed, and then as I go to bed. I'll climb into bed, and I'll be thinking, and frequently I will find that at that point, after I've worked on my sermon, gone over it again, and I go to bed, and I start going through it in my mind, and I don't do this for hours, you know, just for 10 minutes or something, quite frequently I will find, oh, a, an illustration I didn't think of really fits right there, or that, does, that doesn't connect, what can I do? And something else will come to me. And so sometimes the flaws or other options that I hadn't thought of will come to me as I'm going through it in my mind after working at my desk for a while on it. So what you will say, how you will say it, go through it in your mind. Another thing you can do to sort of anchor it in you is to practice it in chunks. Practice your introduction and just your introduction. Practice the body of your talk. Practice your closing. Because for one thing, if you break it up and emphasize those different pieces, you'll make sure that you don't just like it, like your, your conclusion, that you've got some conclusion and you don't just sort of, like they say about the northern border of Canada, it just sort of peters out up there somewhere nobody really knows. A lot of people's sermons do that. It was a Garrison Keillor joke. You know, he said, I don't think you can trust Canadians. You can't trust anybody who on the south have the longest unprotected border in the world, and on the north it just sort of peters out up there. Nobody really knows, you know. <laughs> <That's> um, <laughs> so, 
Some people, servants are like that. We're very trusting folks. You exactly. see, we exactly. don't need artificial yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, but some people, servants just sort of, they don't really have a decent start, they don't have a clear middle, and they don't have a conclusion and an end. If you focus on those as separate pieces, then that may, be, that may become clear to you if you're missing something. Yeah. Stan. Um, in music, uh, one of the first things I learned, a music teacher told me, if you're going to mess up a bit, do it in the middle of somewhere. Yeah. But you've got to get your intro right, and you've got to get the conclusion right. right. So it's the same thing in life. It's the yeah. same principle. And you remember last week I quoted a fellow who said he doesn't write out, he's never worked from a manuscript, there's only five sentences that he writes out and then memorizes. And that's the first sentence and the last four. Same thing. You've got to be clear how you're getting into this and you've got to be clear how you're getting out of it in a way that makes sense and it draws the right conclusion. And focusing on it pieces at a time will help you to do that. And then, if it's possible, practice in front of a live audience. If you have a spouse, a family, a group of friends, to say, I, you know, if you're, especially if you're not feeling comfortable with it, I would look, would you be willing to listen while I do a 20 minute, my 20 minute sermon for you or whatever? Get their feedback. Now, encourage them to give you honest feedback and then pay attention to it if they give you honest feedback. But all of these are ways that you can rehearse this stuff. And not just so you have sure you have the content, but so that your presentation is clear. What is the pace I'm going to use? What gestures feel natural to me at certain points versus what's really mechanical and I shouldn't be doing, etc. All of these different ways that you can rehearse the thing. Make sense? Questions about that? All right, some more practical things. First, you have to be confident. If you're not confident, fake it. <laughs> Nothing makes up for a lack of self-confidence. If you get up there and you clearly are so nervous, you know, you, you can barely speak, it, it simply isn't going to play. No matter how good your message is, if you look like you're too nervous to give it, I guess I think people, it's, they always say a dog can smell fear. Well, so can a congregation. And it's almost as though, I think dogs and congregations, it's the same thing. If you are acting like there's something wrong, then they start feeling like something's wrong and they get nervous. The best way to, pretty much the only way to have confidence to appear comfortable is to do this often enough that you're not so nervous about it. I'm going to give you a couple things like, like deep. One of the things you can do is breathe deep if you're feeling really nervous beforehand. That really does calm a person. But when I say you have to practice, you have to do this in order to get good at it, to be comfortable, well, take opportunities to do it in real life. And if not, then take opportunities to do it in rehearsal. You know, write 10 sermons and prepare them with all the things we've talked about and then record them. Maybe videotape yourself. You can get a bar, you know, buy or borrow a videotape machine. Practice this stuff until you feel like, yes, I can do this, and you have sufficient confidence. Ultimately, when, when I say nothing makes up for a lack of self-confidence, when you're talking about preaching, this is even more true, I think, than in any other kind of setting, because we are supposed to be up here representing God. He is the one who is, has called for this to happen, and is the one who's supposed to be supporting us in this. If we seem scared to death and completely uncomfortable, then what does that say about our faith in God? I mean, in terms of how people perceive it. We have to come across as though we are confident that we're in the right place, doing and saying the right thing, and you all should listen to us right now. I said before, early on, don't ever get in a pulpit like all first-year students wanted to do until I smacked them around about this. They would always want to say, well, you know, I'm no more spiritual than you are, and I don't really have any, any special insights, and I don't, I'm just one of the ordinary people, and, said, and I would always say, how dare you? How dare you climb into a pulpit unless you believe that God at this time in this place has called you to deliver his message, that idea of a prophetic message, meaning a message from God. If you are up there delivering a message God gave you to give to them, then your confidence is in him, not in yourself. And you're not just another person that day. For that period of time when you're in that pulpit preaching that message, you are special. Because God made you special. Not because you're great. Not because you're cool. 
but because God is, and He asks you to do this. So whenever we don't appear to be comfortable or don't appear to have confidence, I think they can get a sense that there's something wrong with this. I mean, confidence is the, is the very least we should have when we're speaking for God. Now, yes, we have, should have some trepidation, too, but we can't be scared or nervous or that uncomfortable. And, and if you're feeling that, remember that it's God that's in charge. He is ultimately responsible for the results if you're faithful. And practice, practice. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice. And again, I cannot say that enough. What we said earlier that, that um, you have to seem comfortable. You have to have confidence. It doesn't mean you have to have bravado, but you can't. Nothing else will work if you don't have that. Yes? I can remember one time when I had to give a very short presentation about diabetes, and it was an overcrowded room, and people were in front of people. And although I was very confident with the topic and with myself, I stood up in front of the group and I shook and kind of really made a mess of the whole thing. And I thought about it afterwards. It was because, well, I was almost angry at the situation. They had overcrowded the room and people couldn't see me and I couldn't see them. And um, the structure of the room didn't allow for good transmission of sound and I don't, right. I don't have a booming voice, so I was really, you know, uh, up against it, so to speak, and I said something to um, somebody afterwards about, oh, I'm sorry if you didn't get from that what I had really intended for you to get, and they said, we never realized that you, the only gray-haired person in the room, were the student. Mm -hmm. We thought you were the professor for all these other people, so we've been asking you all these questions all week long, and you've been really helpful okay. and, and relating to us, but we couldn't relate to you up there. Right. And you know, that's, uh, the self-confidence is sometimes taken yeah. away by the structure. Yeah, and sometimes in a situation like that, you may have to take charge. You may have to say, okay, guys, this is not gonna work. So everybody on that side, would you sit on the floor against the wall? Because where you're standing right now, people can't see over you and, you know, and, and yeah. You know, you're in charge and take charge. And if you need to make some changes, then do whatever you can. It doesn't mean you're going to get in a perfect situation. Sometimes the thing that, the, the astonishing thing, and again, my mentor, Ian Pitt Watson, taught me this. He said, the sermons that I had preached in my life that I thought, boy, I was on that one. That was good. That, yeah, I really, that, I was ready for that. I gave it to him. It was great. He said, invariably, at the end of those, at the back of the church, I got, thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Minister. Very good. Thanks. He said the, there have been any number of times in his life when he felt just a disaster. And I've had this. I felt, and Carolyn will tell you, I will tell her after, man, I didn't feel like that worked. I felt like I got in the middle of it and I wasn't sure where it was going. I didn't feel like the transitions worked or whatever. It just didn't feel right. Well, Ian Pitt Watson said the times in my life that I have felt most inadequate having preached a sermon almost invariably are the times that somebody will call me call me in the middle of the week following and say, you changed my life. When you said this, it was exactly what I needed to hear. And everything is different for me now. Thank you. God bless you. And Ian said, the thing we have to remember when we preach is that frequently it's not the words we say, but in the cracks between the words the Holy Spirit speaks. The fact that we're faithful in getting up there sometimes is all God requires of us. And when we don't feel like it's worked, maybe exactly when God has chosen to do something miraculous. In the cracks between the words, the Holy Spirit speaks. I actually wrote a poem about that and gave it to Ian. Um, and, and was mortified to find out that after that term, that was the first term I ended in, he was photocopying it and giving it out to people in the glasses. <laughs> so, um, but it was based on that. You know, that it's not, it's teller of two stories. His story and our story. And then the cracks between the words. Yes. I'm thinking of a buffet. You, you present what's equivalent to a buffet, and for different people, there are things that are put in. Because it's not one shoe fits everybody. You know? Right. And so parts of your message will, will, should touch hearts. Yeah. And it's you do the best you can, and all the preparation to be faithful for all of this, present it the best way you can. The rest of it's up to God. And that's, that's one of the things that should give you confidence, is the reason I mentioned that here. Um, secondly, be well rested. You stay up all night thinking that you're going to work on this harder and you'll be better and then you get in there and you're bleary-eyed and exhausted and you don't have any energy and you get halfway through it and you think you're going to pass out. You're not helping. So don't do that. Um, 
don't have a really full stomach, if you go out and you get the, you know, the coal miner's breakfast a half an hour before you're supposed to preach, you're not going to do well because the body is going to send all the blood to try to, to try to process all this food in your stomach and you're not going to have any energy, you may feel lightheaded. Weirdly enough, having too much food in your stomach can make you feel more lightheaded than not having enough. Eat something light, something, you know, perhaps something with a, a cup of coffee, maybe bulletproof coffee, or <laughs> maybe a muffin if you feel like you need a little sugar to, you know, to give you a little energy or whatever. Something light to get you through, but don't overeat because that will not, that doesn't play well. Um, you need to look the part. This is back to that ethos thing. It is very appropriate if you've been invited to come and preach somewhere and you don't know that church, it's very appropriate in the week before to call and say, I'm just, I'm just calling to ask, um, what's, what's your usual dress code? What do your preachers, visiting preachers usually wear? Are, you know, do they wear robes? Do you wear a suit and tie? Is it more casual? There is nothing wrong with asking that question. In fact, better you ask that question than you show up wearing a Mexican tuxedo and everybody there is wearing a thousand dollar suit. I'm not saying you can go out and buy a, you know, an expensive suit. I'm just saying if it's a coat and tie kind of place, then you should wear a coat and tie. Look the part. Don't, don't be awkward about that unless you're trying to make some kind of point. Um, I heard recently about uh, a church had, they'd been announcing that they had hired a new pastor who was highly reputed, they knew his name, they read some of his books and everything else. Well, the week before he was supposed to take over, he showed up dressed like a street person and wandered around, you know, he would sit different places and see how people reacted. He would say hello to people. Well, the next week he shows up and he's the minister. And he said, let me tell you about what my experience here was here last week, dressed like somebody who lives in the street. Um, and so he was trying to make a point by not fitting in. But typically, if you're the preacher, I'm not, I'm not saying you have to buy into all of their values. I'm just saying, unless you were specifically trying to make a point about something, look the part. Fair? Stand behind the podium, don't lean on it. Okay? Assuming you're, you're not a free platform kind of guy, or, or a woman. You, you know, this kind of thing, unless you're leaning in to make a point, that's not what a podium is for. I told you about that one of the first oral interp competitions I was ever in. I asked for a podium, and the, the university professor said, oh, you want to lean on it? And I said, no. I was like a freshman or sophomore in college, or high school, sophomore in high school. Oh, you want to hide behind it? No, you know. <laughs> well, that's not what this is for. This is to hold your notes. This is to establish that you're the one preaching, not them. But other than that, don't, you know, understand. And that has to do with posture, it has to do with stance, it has to do with, you know, presentation. Arrive early. Nothing will panic a church more than you showing up 10 minutes before you're supposed to preach. Okay? Um, you may feel like you're sure you're going to be there and everything is fine, but they don't know that. And there's several, so one, you don't want to scare everybody by, by showing up late. Plus, you need to get there early enough, ideally before a lot of people are there, so that you get a chance to go up and stand in the pulpit. If the sound person is there, you get to try out the microphone and find out how sensitive it is. And, you know, is it a, is a floor mic? Is it a lavalier mic? You know, are you doing the Garth Brooks thing with the head the headpiece? Um, so you, you get familiar with the setup, you check the, the technical pieces of it, you test it, again, if there's somebody there to help you with that. Um, you may want to practice how it feels in that pulpit, etc. It gives you an opportunity to pray before you, you get up there in that setting. Um, all of those are things that are very important, so show up early if you're going to preach. You know, I preach here every week that we're not gone, and Carolyn and I will get here at 8.45 for a 10 o'clock service. Um, we're usually among the first people here. There's usually somebody here who opens up. i got to be here for choir. She's got to be here for choir anyway. <laughs> but, but the idea is, even if you didn't have to be here for choir, we would be here an hour and 15 minutes early. And they know I'm coming, because I come every week. So if you're, especially if you're visiting, it's a good idea to come if you're a regular. But if you're visiting, if the, you know, then show up early. Um, Sit in all four corners of the room. This does several things. One, if you get there early and you sit in, full, in all, you know, around four corners, meaning just around the auditorium, 
you both will get a feeling for what they're seeing. It will give you an opportunity to pray for all of the people who are going to be in all those different sections. And it will give you a comfort level. You will sort of have mapped out the place where the people who are going to be hearing you are going to be sitting. It's a very, it actually gives you an elevated sense of comfort, I believe, if you do that, especially praying. Um, I don't think she probably would mind me saying, Victoria Smith on Sundays will come in here before service and she walks up and down the rows praying for whoever's going to be sitting in all the different chairs. Well, in effect, if you get there early and you just, even if you just position yourself at various places in the back and then you get a chance to pray for people, get a chance to pray that God's will would be done through you on that given day, right? Very powerful things. And I think that's wonderful that Victoria does that. Visualize yourself speaking. Again, if you're sitting in the various chairs and you, you, you're up there, you can visualize what you will look like up there and then go and stand in the pulpit and visualize what it will be like when you are actually doing the preaching and, and the people are out there. And you know, You've all heard that when you're feeling really nervous, you've all heard the old adage that picture that your audience is all in their underwear. Right? If, you're, if you're feeling nervous about them, that actually, as long as it doesn't cause you to burst into either laughter or chagrin, um, then that can be a very calming kind of thing because it will make you smile and you, you'll be okay with that. Um, use deep breathing if you're nervous. Again, if you, you know, in, in, in with the love, out with the jive. In with the love, out with the jive, as a friend of Carolyn used to say. Breathing deep will settle your diaphragm, it'll get rid of the, the butterflies, it will help you calm down. A very practical sort of thing. So do that and even do it right before you stand up. Don't, you know, don't. Don't be sitting on the platform going, <gasps> because people are going, what? Do we need to call somebody? You know, what's wrong with him? So, but just breathing deep will help settle you. And realize that it won't be perfect, not from a human perspective. You are not going to bat a thousand when you preach. Not even with one sermon, it's going to be a thousand. The best, you know, the best batters in history got. 400, which means four out of every 10. You're not going to succeed in every sermon. You, everything you do in a given day is not going to be perfect. But recognize, remember, this is not up to you. Your job is to be faithful, to do the work, to pray through it, to prepare yourself, to do everything you can to do this well as is honoring to God, and then it's His job. And know that you may mess up, like, like Ian said. He, he, the sermons that he thought he had done the worst on are the ones that change people's lives. It's not just up to us. Okay? Questions about any of that? Well, I promised you I would do uh, something this week, and I actually am fulfilling my promise. Um, Marvin, could you help me and Stan also? Could you give one of those to everybody and give me back the remainders? And oh, let me give let me have one of those, uh, Marvin. And we're giving them all away. Yeah. This paper really thin. It's just not. Okay. I'll be back in half an hour. Okay. <laughs> now I told you last a couple of weeks ago, a few few classes ago rather, uh, I gave you a copy of a sermon that I had done, so that you could see how I structured a sermon and the fact that I scripted it and all of that kind of stuff. That is not to suggest, neither that nor this is to suggest we got perfect all the time. But I told you I would bring the order of worship and uh, let you see how I structured this stuff so you could see where it all fits in. Uh, again, I'm not selling this to you. Uh, I actually was quite pleased. Um, one of our elders had a minister friend of uh, hers and spouse and family members who came to visit us and she told me later you know there were a bunch of stuff in your service he really liked he was making notes about all the things he really likes and wants to, wants to start doing so we're doing something right um, first the single sheet the single sheet is this is the inside of our bulletin but this lays out in one one sheet so you can glance at it there is great power in one piece of paper people often don't get that to be able to look at something and see it all in one piece of paper without flipping pages or whatever. This is our order of worship. And you'll notice pre uh, preparing for worship, prelude, music, uh, the announcements, and then prayer of praise and adoration, which, which is where I call for people, you know, to, in a moment of silence, we turn our hearts toward you. Um, then the call to worship, 
inviting people to stand and sing and worship, and then uh, two songs, we do the responsive reading, and people stand during that. You'll notice the asterisk is where people stand up, and then a, a third hymn. Then people sit down during the third hymn, the prayer of confession, and then assurance of pardon. Um, the readings from the lectionary, the scripture readings, uh, Old Testament, New Testament, and then I read the gospel, or whoever preacher is reads the gospel. The pastoral prayer. I mentioned before, I believe, the first <coughs> Sunday of the month we do communion. Second Sunday of the month, which is what this was, we do the Apostles' Creed, the oldest of the church creeds. The third Sunday of the month we do the Nicene Creed. And then the fourth and or fifth Sundays, if there is one, we can do something else. We have the sermon. Um, Thanksgiving through tithes and offerings, the doxology, a final hymn, benediction, and then we do the Gloria Patri. When I get up in the pulpit Sunday morning before everybody else gets here, you know, I always tape one of these up. I probably haven't glanced at it twice in six years, five and a half years, whatever. But I know, plus anybody who's done this with us before knows, if anybody gets lost, it's right there. Okay, where are we? We just had the prayer of confession. Oh, this is, you know, we're here for the up to the reading of God's Word. So that is a summary. And if that's of help to you, you're welcome to borrow anything on that you want to. Yes? Could I ask, why is it you have people stand for the Gospel reading? Um, that's a tradition in the church because the Gospel is considered, it's about Jesus. And we ask people to stand. It, it, the same, same thing, I had a friend, I used to attend an Episcopal church, and I had a friend once say, you know, I really don't like it that they bow when the priest comes in. And I went, no, no, no. The front of the processional in an Anglican church service is somebody carrying the cross. And the priest walks behind them. They're not bowing to the priest, they're bowing to the cross. And so whenever, and, and that means that they're bowing because that's a symbol of Jesus. The reason people stand for the gospel is because it is a showing of respect to Jesus. That's what the gospels are about. There's no rule about that. There's no law about it. Not all churches do that. It's something that I like to do. So we do it. Make sense? Any other questions about any of those elements first? And then I'll now this is the this is the outline. This is the order of worship. This is the actual inside of the bulletin that everybody gets to look at. Now what only I see is this other document, which is all of the content that comes under those headings. You will notice. Welcome and announcements I've got. The prayer of invocation and adoration. We have written prayers. So the prayer of invocation, adoration, um, as we, um, that we may experience your presence as we prepare, us, prepare ourselves in a moment of silence, or in a moment of silence we prepare our hearts for you. We have a silent reflection. I finished that prayer, the call to worship, uh, in terms of singing, the songs, then the next second page we have the responsive reading for that week. This, by the way, is the same week as the sermon I gave you. So the sermon fits in here. This is the... the service we had where I preached the resurrection sermon. Um, the prayer of confession is in here, the assurance of pardon, the just, uh, I don't have all of the lectionary scriptures written out here. I do have the gospel reading because again, I'm working from this. The people who are doing the other readings, I give them copies of what they're going to read and they bring it with them. Uh, if we had to, we could pull out a Bible and they could work from that. But I always have, when I the readers are selected, and somebody else does that in our church. I used to do it, and it's something someone else can do. She lets me know who the readers are, and then I email them the readings that they're doing. If it's the scripture reading, the responsive reading, or the prayer of confession, I send that to them. When I come on Sunday morning, about one time a quarter, somebody will have forgotten to bring their reading. Whether it be the scripture reading, the prayer of confession, the responsive reading is not a problem because everybody gets one. It's in the bulletin and insert. But I always bring extra copies of those. So if somebody went, oh no, I left my con the, you know, the confession prayer that I'm supposed to do on the counter at, at home, I give, them a, I give them a copy. So this is all kind of preparing to lead the worship stuff, not so much the preaching. The pastoral prayer, Lord's Prayer, we, all, we, we go into the Lord's Prayer at the, uh, at the end of our pastoral prayer. In this case, again, we do the Apostles' Creed, which is written in here because I use this. I also, I use this document when, when we're doing the responsive reading, because I step back, the person leading the responsive reading steps in the pulpit, I step back, but I've got this in front of me, so I can read it. Um, the sermon, and what I will do is, you'll notice at the bottom of page six, it says, sermon, why we believe in the resurrection. I deal with, this as one document, the sermon is a separate document, 
I print this out, I print the sermon out, and then I just insert the sermon in here. So that when I get what's page six on this, the next page I'm looking at is the first page of my sermon, and I'm ready to preach the sermon. And I, I never staple this, by the way. This is all loose when I'm in the pulpit. After the sermon, we have the Thanksgiving through tithes and offerings, the doxology, the last hymn, the benediction, and the glory of pottery. So this is the structure that we use. And there's different readings every week. You know, we all use a different, uh, a different creed, either Apostles or Nicene or, or Communion. But I don't change this a lot. And sometimes I start going, like, should I start changing this? And I will ask people, and they go, no, we really like it. People like continuity. They like to know what's happening next. Some churches feel like, you know, they have worship directors or whatever, feel like they're not doing their job unless they completely change the order of worship from one week to the next. I think all you do then is you make people not sure what's going on. You make them, you make them uncertain about stuff. Having the same basic structure with different elements within each of those spots, I think, is good. And we, maybe we are getting to the place that we need to have a little bit different, maybe a little different order, maybe a little different stuff. But for the most part, I don't think we need to worry about that all the time. I mean, Anglican churches, for instance, they read exactly the same thing every week in terms of the rite. If they're doing rite one, people know exactly what the, the, you know, the leader says and exactly what the responses are. And it does not, that doesn't change from week to week. We have different content within it, the same basic structure. Does that make sense? Questions about that? This is not the preparing of a sermon, but it's critically important that you understand that too if you're going to go in that direction. This might be of help to you. Any questions about anything we've talked about today? Chris. You talked about using a pulpit, and you said the other day that you were going to start moving around. So is that going to be big? Like, is there other things you have to know if you're going to walk around? Or are there things that are distracting when you're walking around? Well, the, the one thing is that you can't use a stationary mic. Yeah, yeah. You have, you, to, you have to use lavalier or... Right. or um, Headset, headset or something else, yeah. you know. And now there's different kinds of headsets. When I when I did this, we have a headset. I call it the Garth, you know, Garth Brooks because he and Madonna and others they have one that's really visible, you know, and it sticks right in front of their mouth. I don't like that. Um, I have headsets, and the one I have, the wires were peeled back, so it was popping, and so I stopped using it for a while. But it goes. It's a real thin wire. It goes over my ears, and it comes down here, and it's so small that I'll, I'll be saying hello to people before church, and I'll have it on, and I'll go, what's on your beard? You know, because it looks like I've got a speck of something there. That, to me, is better because it's not visible. It doesn't cover your mouth. It's not in front of anything. So, uh, But you do have to have a microphone that lets you move around. You need to think about any obstructions. The last thing, and, and where the edge of the stage is, the last thing you need is to end up you know, in somebody's lap in the front row. Um, so all of those things. You also need to be concerned about, I think, lines of sight. Because, for instance, if the pulpit is here, if I'm preaching behind the pulpit, it's very, it's very clear. But if, if the pulpit is there and there are people sitting over there, and I'm here and it's this kind of pulpit, they're not going to be able to see me. Right. So I better have the pulpit placed in such a place that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand here and I'm going to be moving around toward the front so that they can still see me. They're not going to have something between them you know, not a speaker or whatever, especially in our new church, which is what I'm referring to and generally. The platform is three steps up, right. which means if we put a large speaker there, then even that is going to be a visual destruction if I let myself get behind it. Right. Uh, so yeah, all of those are, are things you need to be concerned about. I confess I have I've thought about that, all those things and I'm aware of them. I have not done a lot of preaching where I leave the pulpit and wander around because this is my, right. other than one-off kinds of things, I've preached a few times before, but this is my preaching experience right, right here. Done a lot of teaching, a lot of public speaking, yeah. so, but this is my preaching experience. So some of this is going to be stuff I'm going to have to figure out. Well, you we're... also have to have projected notes then, because where are your notes? Well, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, when we talked about that, my goal, and I, it's going to be, we probably won't be able to do this right away, because the big, these 5,000 lumen projectors are not cheap. Caroline just brought two of them back. Um, the goal will be to have a projector that projects an outline for me on the back wall. It also will project the lyrics for the choir, because the choir is going to be facing that direction, and they'll be able to look up and see the lyrics. For the time being, they're going to be using hymnals, because that's our only option. So, when we first start out in our new church, I may still be preaching behind the pulpit. 
My goal will be to figure out, as soon as I can, either with another projector or something, how I can start being more mobile to get out there because I think it is a barrier. It's a visual barrier. I think that I can be more effective if I'm not tied to it. But I do still need something. Now, if I, if I work hard enough at it, if I've got my notes and outlines and stuff on the pulpit so that if, if, if it's on the pulpit, the pulpit's over there, you know, where I'm over here, um, if I really start having a problem, I can always go over and look down at it and then move around again. The ideal would be that I learn it well enough that I don't even need. I, I said last week some people say that the only people who should have notes in the pulpit are people who don't really need them. So if I get to the place where I will have notes in case I ever do need them, I get completely lost, forget where I am, and I'll have something to look at, that doesn't mean I have to be standing here the whole time. You know, I'll be able to move around and remember where I am and come over here if I need to. But I think projecting it on the back wall would keep that from being a problem. Make sense? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, gestures. Okay. Like, I mean, you use plenty of gestures. Um, are those just natural, or did, or did you have to think at some point? Oh, I need to start gesturing more. Or, hey, my natural gestures. When I watch myself say on video doing it, I don't think I should do X, Y, and Z. I mean, is there any? Do you have any control over that, or is it just a? It's really just what you do naturally. Well, you have some control over everything. For instance, this is not the way to preach. Because not only is it too informal, it doesn't have dignity. Standing up there with your hands in your pockets, I don't even do that when I teach usually. Um, unless you're trying to make a point of something. But one of the, the worst things, not only does this not have dignity, and some people would, might even be offended by it, but you do this and you're not going to be making, you know, that's the most gesture you're going to make. So you need to have your hands loose and free. Um, don't, you know, don't lock them into something. I have too much of a tendency, again, to be honest, on the pulpit of doing this on the sides of the pulpit. Now, and I don't do that all the time, but I catch myself doing that more than I should. So, you have a lot of gestures, for instance, as you were just telling me that, you know, do you do this or do you do this? You know, what are your options on that? Um, most people who speak naturally have some kind of gestures. So be aware of what your gestures are. I don't think, unless you have a special point you want to make, you know, like you say your sermon text is, you know, and it hit me right between the eyes. Then you can think about that or, or whatever it is as a special thing. But all of this stuff that I do here, I don't think about that. And I don't think you should, e should either because if you, if you think too hard about it, it becomes stilted, becomes mechanical, and you're going, I, I think there's something wrong with him. <laughs> you know, he's doing weird stuff up here, you know. Um, and when I said the thing about Adolf Hitler, his, his you know, his, all of all these super dramatic kinds of things he would do, it looks so scary artificial. Um, we don't want to go there. So be aware of your own gestures. Be comfortable enough that your gestures are natural. If you've got special points you want to make that you think a gesture would do it, you know, or you know, you're talking about, uh, I said, I see that hand, you know, then fine, do that. But otherwise, I think it's just what comes natural. And if you are somebody who tends to tends to talk like this, well, you have a number of things you need to get get over. You need to learn to stand upright more. You need to learn to have better posture. You need to sort of loosen up your arms. In fact, I've seen a lot of speakers. I've seen a lot of pre and. They're doing this stuff. It's like somebody stapled their elbows to their sides, you know, and that's the most they could get. You got to be prepared to do this when it's necessary, when it's appropriate, and you've got to get your elbows away from your sides if you're going to do any kind of gesturing at all. But that's practice. That's the only way you can get that. And mostly, it's what's natural for you. Because if you start trying to use some, oh, I really like that gesture. I'm going to learn how to do that. They're going to go. That reminds me of somebody. Who is that? You know. Don't do that. It should be natural. Stan? Um, I've taken some media relations courses, like how to represent your company and stuff. Like mm -hmm. that, when you go like this, like this close, yeah. that's the way they teach you. Because uh, when we frame up for a camera, oh, right. you know, you're basically from here up yeah. is normally the way they shoot you. So if you're going to make a gesture and do something, you're doing it right, basically, almost shoulder to face left. 
Yeah, that's true if they're videotaping you. It's not true if you're speaking. From no, the right, absolutely. Yeah. All right. well, the other one I'd say is, you know, just the pulpit itself. If you're ma making gestures, think of that frame again. Right. You know, in the line of sight. Yeah. yeah. I, most most people's gestures are here up. Yeah. They yeah. should be able to see that anyway. Um, what you're saying is absolutely true, and this gets to the point of being aware of your medium. Yeah. People who are you ever wonder why some people do really well as actors or actresses on films, but don't translate well to TV or vice versa? It's because, uh, or, or, I'm sorry, that's, I did, that's not what I meant to say. I meant theater, stage, stage theater, but don't translate well to like television. It's because in stage theater, you know, you don't have, it, there's no, no close-ups. They gotta see everything you're doing from the back row. And so there tends to be Big arm movements. <laughs> That's my a good friend of ours, uh, Doug, Doug Clark. Uh, he said that he, he and I started seminary at the same time we were both working in the mall. I was selling men's clothing at uh, one end of it. He was selling flooring at the other end, you know, two anchor stores. And he was just an assistant. And one day they got a call. Somebody wanted to buy a lot of flooring, whatever. And, and the main salesperson was out. And he called him and said, you know, they, and she they said, I can't come, so you do it. He goes, I can't do it. He said, sure you can. There's one secret to selling flooring. Big arm movements. Walk in there and go, okay, what you need is wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, and then you need, you need uh, area rugs over top of that. So big arm movements. That's the secret. Big arm movements. So, well, he sold everything to this people. And he said, yeah, I love the big arm movements because they work. If you're in theater... You basically have to be bigger than life in order for people in the back rows to see you. You do that same thing on a movie screen or television, either one, and they're going to go, what is wrong with him or her? So you have to adjust based upon the medium. The same thing is true. If, you know, if this is, they're seeing you and you've got gestures, then they're going to have to be right here. But if you're standing in a pulpit, you can get outside that box. You know, you, it doesn't do a whole lot of good to do anything down here. You know, we were just, you know, <laughs> nobody's going to get that uh, unless you're out in the middle of the stage. So, yeah, it, it, you have to have some concern for that. But you do this a few times, and this becomes very natural. The only thing that would probably be a problem is if you're, if you're so concentrated on the script, then you're not, you know, you're not, if you don't look up, you're not going to gesture. And so you have to develop that ability. Takes practice. Other questions or comments? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Okay. So often people don't laugh at that. Um, thank you all very much.